Welcome everybody to our chapter 10 discussion. This particular topic today is one that I think is not one that necessarily comes to mind when it comes to how exercise can improve on this condition. When we talk about things like obesity or we talk about type 2 diabetes and metabolic disorders or some musculoskeletal issues, those I think easily come to mind when it comes to exercise. But cancer the C word, the other C word, right? The big bad one. This one is something I think that most people really don't know much about when it comes to the benefits of exercise and how it can actually impact folks that are suffering with all types of varying uh, forms of cancer. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. I've chopped this down to make it a little bit shorter because there was a whole lot in here about all the different types of chemo and all the different types of medications. And rather than spend a lot of time on all of those, let's just get into some basic definitions, some things that you need to know about cancer itself, about some of the effects of how treatment will affect them that might impact the way you need to work with them. And then we'll talk about some of the benefits. And the other thing to go along with this chapter, so not only will you have this, my recorded lecture and notes for this, but you will also have a documentary film called The C Word that I would like for you to watch. Very entertaining, uh, very informative, and really it talks a lot about not just the treatment, but prevention. So your quiz for this particular chapter, for chapter number 10, is going to pull from this discussion here and also from that film. So make sure that you take the time to watch both. It's going to be helpful to you. So here we go. We'll talk about the pathology of cancer here. Uh, not too in-depth. There's obviously a lot more you could get into, but a malignant tumor versus a benign tumor. Right? I guess we'll start with the one all the way on the bottom. A benign tumor has unregulated growth without invasion. That's important because the without invasion is good because that's not cancer. But a malignant cancer cell or a malignant tumor has the following capabilities. And don't worry so much about having to get all the definitions to all of these. They're a little bit beyond our scope. But these are some descriptors of what a malignant cancer cell is able to do. It's got sustained proliferative signaling. It is evading growth suppressors. So it just keeps growing regardless. It resists cell death. It enables replicative immortality. So it continues to replicate at a rate that is unsafe and unnormal, un not normal. It induces angiogenesis, activating invasion and metastasis. And we'll get into invasion and metastasis a little more here. It reprograms the energy metabolism and it evades destruction from the immune system. So these, when someone says something is a cancer and we talk about cancer itself, just these descriptors alone, regardless of how much you know about what all of these words are, that tells you that this is something really invasive, scary, powerful, and um, therefore it really is going to significantly impact someone's life. It is a uh, dangerous condition. It is an unfortunate one, and it is one that plagues us as a planet, really, far more often now than ever before. Speaking of that, here in the United States, the American Cancer Society reports that today, one in four deaths occurring in the United States is a result of cancer. In the U.S., 86% of all cancers are diagnosed in people that are over or equal to the age of 50. So it is something that typically sets in later in life. But cancer is also the second leading cause of death among children, excuse me, between the ages of 1 and 14 years in the United States. Now, again, it's not common in children, but when it comes to the what causes the deaths of children in the United States, it's the second most common reason. Uh, reason being is little kids are supposed to be healthy. They're not supposed to succumb to chronic diseases. They shouldn't have a high death rate. They're usually going to come be a result of things like accidents, car accidents, freak accidents, that sort of thing. Uh, and then childhood cancer would be number two. So as, as terrible and as unfortunate as it is, it is something that is primarily associated with adults, but kids do get it. And when they do, uh, it, it is one of the leading causes of death for kids, unfortunately. So couple basic statistics for you there. 
As far as pathophysiology goes, it's viewed mostly as a genetic disease that occurs due to some GNA mutations, and it is brought on by exposure to carcinogens or they occur spontaneously. So that's one of the things is we all have cancer cells in our bodies. Now that doesn't nece necessarily mean that they will do anything or they will grow out of control and become a huge problem. But if they continue to mutate, if they are exposed to certain carcinogens that wake them up and cause them to go into this growth, well, that's usually what we're talking about there. And that can happen over time or it can occur spontaneously. Other mutations can occur when certain genes, so if someone in their genetic code, uh, if their gene products regulate DNA replication or repair, if those get mutated, an example is a gene known as the P53 gene, that has been associated with being one that is a signal for cancer uh, setting in, in in an individual. Here's something that you should know. This is about classification of cancer in terms of um, severity. So they use this thing called the TNM model, where they look at tumor, node, and metastasis classification. So this is where we'll talk about metastasis, which we mentioned a little bit earlier. The T, that describes the size of the tumor. And the tumor is ranked on a scale from zero to four. So a T0 is no tumor, and a T4 is a tumor invasion of a vital organ such as the heart or lungs okay so that's a significant tumor and it's invading one of your vital organs the n the node describes your lymph nodes and it's affected by which lymph nodes are going to be affected by the cancer it is scored as an no so no invasion of the lymph nodes all the way up to an n3 so that's significant invasion of the lymph nodes and then the letter m is the metastasis and that describes the presence or absence of cancer metastasis to other organs of the body so is it spreading to other areas that's what metastasis means is it going in other places so if it's designated as an mo that means there's no metastasis it is localized it is contained in just this one location or an m1 which is there are metastases present it has spread it has infected other organs and other areas of the body so that one is just an O or a 1. It's either not metastasized or it is metastasized. It's either localized or the cancer itself has traveled and is affecting other organs. Now, we'll talk a little more about lymph nodes and all that in just a little bit when we get into lymphedema. So if you're not quite understanding everything yet, stay tuned. I'll explain in just a few minutes. All right, so once we go through this classification process, once the TNM descriptors of a given tumor have been defined, those are combined together in an overall stage grouping and comprising a simple set of stages. So that's stage zero all the way up to stage four. So if you heard of, oh, stage four cancer or stage two cancer, this is uh, achieved through looking at that TNM descriptor score. In brief, the lower stage numbers, so like stage one cancer, those are used to describe a small primary tumor with no metastases. So it's not spread, it's just a little guy, it's localized, it's right there. Whereas higher numbers, like a stage four, that's used to describe a cancer that has metastasized to other organs or throughout the body. So that's much more severe, much more invasive, uh, and more significant impairment and effects on the entire body. Now, it gets treated through a number of ways that you've probably heard about. So here's a little bit on treatment. Uh, radiation therapy is a local form of treatment targeting only the area of the tumor. So they expose the tumor to radiation. It delivers high energy particles or high energy waves like x-rays or gamma rays. Those are designed to destroy or damage the cancer cells, prevent the growth and division of the cancer cell, by actually breaking up the DNA molecule inside the cell. So it's targeting the DNA molecules in those cells to the point where they can no longer grow, they can no longer replicate. It's very localized, it's aimed only at the tumor itself. Chemotherapy, on the other hand, this involves delivering some drugs. These are called chemotherapy drugs. They're put into the bloodstream, they are meant to treat cancer cells that have metastasized to other parts of the body. Now, as for how long someone would go through chemotherapy, 
it's based on a couple of different things. Uh, it's based on the type of tumor, the phase the tumor is in, how well the person is able to tolerate chemotherapy in and of itself and the person's general condition. And when you watch the movie, we'll, you'll see a little bit more about what we mean there in terms of their general condition and, and conditioning. And it goes back to things we've talked about in most of our other courses and why having good health and, and a good lifestyle all throughout is important because that will help to maybe minimize the risk for things even like this, even like cancer. At least that's what some doctors and experts have to say. Now, chemotherapy can significantly reduce the risk of cancer recurrence after surgery. So if someone has surgery to remove a tumor and again, get it out of the system that way, chemotherapy is used and it can, again, it's not perfect, but it can reduce the risk of recurrence. So that's always a concern for someone who has had been diagnosed with cancer at some point. There is uh, biological therapy as well. This includes immunotherapy, biotherapy, or biological response modifier therapy. This uses a variety of large molecules to fight cancer or to lessen the side effects of some cancer treatments. This form of treatment usually interferes with cancer cell growth, so that's why it's used. It, it's helping to stop the cells from growing. Uh, it can act to directly help healthy immune cells control cancer in certain therapies, so it kind of gives a little boost to your normal immune cells, or it helps to repair normal cells that might be damaged by other forms of cancer treatment. Remember, with radiation or with chemotherapy, those are pretty invasive drugs, and while they are designed to affect cancer, they do affect other parts of the body too that can get damaged. So this biological therapy might be used to counteract some of those effects. Another treatment option, again, in some cases, is bone marrow transplant. So diseased bone marrow is destroyed using large doses of chemotherapeutic agents, radiation, or both. So this is what I was referring to when I said that radiation and chemo, while they are designed to kill cancer, well, they also affect the rest of the body, and it can affect your bone marrow. Now, the person's blood forming system is then replaced with either bone marrow cells from the same person when he is in remission. So this is where they take your own bone marrow from a healthier time. Uh, that's known as autologous bone marrow transplant. Or they use a tissue antigen match donor. So this is where someone else would come in with some healthy bone marrow, and that's called allogen allogenic. Hormone therapy is another option for treatment. This uses drugs to modify body hormones. So these, in essence, will do things like stopping the synthesis of certain hormones or change their effects on specific cells. And again, this is all aimed at helping to stop those tumors from growing. Only some tumors are hormone receptive positive. So not every type of cancer is gonna be responsive to this type of treatment, but the ones that are, primarily are ones that you have undoubtedly heard about, and that's breast cancer and prostate cancer. So one of the uh, types of treatment therapy that you might have is hormone therapy for someone that has been diagnosed with either breast cancer or prostate cancer. Now, as we mentioned, lots of different treatment options, and they're all pretty invasive and significant. So Needless to say, there are also some pretty significant side effects, and these depend on what type of medicine they're getting, uh, what type of treatment they're receiving, the type of radiation, the types of drugs, how much of it's being given to them, how long do they have to be under this treatment protocol. Early side effects, these are things you've probably heard about when folks that are dealing with cancer. Early side effects are nausea, vomiting, uh, temporary hair loss, an increased chance of infections, right? Your immune system is impacted, so your ability to get infections goes up. Fatigue, so you're just generally tired all the time. Maybe the skin changes. You're not hungry anymore. Pain, uh, hemorrhagic and thromboembolic complications. So those are things that might affect some of the other uh, processes and, and conditions in the body. We talked about um, hemorrhaging and how that might cause a stroke. So these can be complications. There might be allergic reactions. And that's all the early stuff. So this is all 
as things begin, as we start introducing this type of therapy into someone's body once they've had this condition. Late side effects are ones that don't show up right away. They might take months or even years to develop, and some of them are often permanent. So these show up and will be something to contend with later on in life potentially, and they do not necessarily go away. Things like we'll talk about in a little bit here, such as edema now, or lymphedema. Uh, severe side effects include toxicities in many body systems and organs. So while yes, we have treatment, yes, there are things, uh, it is a rough road, folks. It is something that is really difficult to go through. If you've ever either dealt with yourself or, or have seen a family member, a close family member or friend battle with this, then you already know what I'm talking about. This is a really uh, invasive disease and the treatment, while it is aimed to be good, I mean, it's just tough. It's a very difficult process. Now we mentioned fatigue and, and that's something that obviously we would be concerned with as exercise professionals if we're working with someone either with cancer or is in remission from cancer. It is the most common side effect of cancer and cancer treatment, so of both, especially when you combine them both. This is going to affect up to 70% of those who have cancer during chemo and radiotherapy and even after surgery. So they are all going to be more fatigued than the general person. These folks, they are, in, they are usually advised to rest and decrease their level of activity. So that's usually what the doctors tell them. That's what their caregivers, their family members tell them. So they go into this sedentary behavior pattern so that they can recover. However, as we already know, the more inactive you are, well, that's problematic. That can promote muscular catabolism. So your muscles will start to shrink and break down and extensive periods of rest may lead to chronic fatigue. It's like the old, the age old adage, the, the more rest you get, the more tired you are because you're not even used to moving around. So that's why it's better to be active. And, and we'll make that argument as we go through the rest of this here. Other issues, uh, anemia, pain, emotional distress, like depression and anxiety. You could imagine being depressed or being rather anxious after this type of diagnosis. Sleep disturbances, nutritional problems, especially if you're nauseous all the time, you can't eat. Uh, low level physical activity and medicines, these are all possible causes when it comes to fatigue. Fatigue is mainly caused by the illness itself. So in addition to treatment and all the other stuff we've talked about, just simply having cancer is exhausting and can be fatiguing. Uh, treatment and inactivity then result in further deconditioning. Those sedentary habits usually recommended by biomedical staff in the family, they're meant to protect that person. But again, this leads to a self-perpetuating fatigue cycle. So the more tired they are, the less they want to do. But the less that they do, well, the more tired that they are. So it is not such a good thing. And we know just from even working with general population that just being more active gives you more energy. It can be better. So exercise can certainly improve with some of this cancer-related fatigue. That's one of the biggest reasons why it should be included in someone's treatment. Now, we're going to talk about lymphedema here. Uh, it can occur after a surgical removal of lymph nodes or after radiotherapy that affects the lymph nodes. So if you're getting radiation and it's going to impact your lymph nodes, lymphedema can result. So I'll give you a little bit of background information here that's not listed right here in this slide, and maybe it'll make the rest of the bullets make a little more sense for you. So lymphedema or your lymphatic system is really important to keeping your body healthy. It helps to circulate protein rich lymph fluid throughout your body, which that lymph fluid, the purpose of it is it collects bacteria, viruses and waste products. OK, so it's running through your body and it's picking those things up. Your lymphatic system carries this fluid and harmful substances through your lymph vessels, which lead to the lymph nodes. The wastes are then filtered out by lymphocytes which are infection fighting cells that live inside of your lymph nodes. And ultimately they then get flushed out of your body. So they really are an important part of keeping you healthy. 
So lymphedema is something that occurs when your lymph vessels are unable to adequately drain lymph fluid. Remember, it's going out to different parts of the body, it's picking things up, and then it's coming back to the lymph nodes to drop off the bad stuff and have it cleaned out. Now, when your lymph vessels are affected and then your the vessels cannot get the lymph fluid out of different areas, well, then we have problems. And this is something that's going to happen usually out at the extremities, like your arm or your leg. It's very common to see someone with lymphedema in their leg. A lymphedema can be either a primary condition or a secondary condition. So what does that mean? Well, it means that it can occur on its own or it can be caused by another disease or condition. Now, what we're talking about here, especially in connection with cancer, it is secondary lymphedema. It's far more common than primary lymphedema. So while primary lymphedema can happen, it is not quite as common as secondary lymphedema and like we said it can happen after the surgical removal of lymph nodes associated with cancer or after you go through radiation therapy all right so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense there so that lymph fluid going back into kind of what the slide says here that results in an, accumula an accumulation of this interstitial fluid of this lymph fluid and then it gets inflamed and this part of the body will swell up due to that lymph fluid just being caught there. So this is where it happens again, out in the uh, upper limbs or the lower limbs. Now, upper limb lymphedema in the arms is common following lymphadenectomy due to breast cancer. Lower extremity lymphedema is more common with uterine cancer, prostate cancer, lymphoma, or melanoma. So that makes a little bit of sense in concerning where you're being treated in proximity to either the upper or lower limbs, at least for uterine cancer, prostate cancer, and then alternatively in the upper limb portion of the body, like breast cancer. So healthcare professionals will often warn individuals that they should avoid intense upper body exercise in order to avoid causing lymphedema. However, and this is important, and this is the kind of things that you're battling against. It's, it's amazing out there that as well-educated and as helpful as doctors are, there is still a lot that gets missed in terms of the whole medicine picture. And that's really what the film I want you guys to watch is all about, is how physicians sometimes and caretakers really miss the mark because they don't really know as much as out there. And the research that even would talk more about it is not even getting done the way that it should because quite frankly, it doesn't profit for someone. It doesn't make them a lot of money. So a lot of the good advice about healthy lifestyle and the four pillars of living healthy in order to be anti-cancer, which we'll talk about in the film, those get missed. So healthcare professionals usually instead will tell someone, hey, don't do these types of exercise because if you do, it might cause lymphedema in the upper extremities. However, like we said, there, the data doesn't necessarily exist that shows that there's a link between upper body exercise and breast cancer related lymphedema. So that's advice that they're getting that might not be the best advice and could lead to further deconditioning and problems. And then finally, let's get in. That's what these last several slides are all about. So what can exercise do when someone has cancer? Uh, the film really goes into things about what can be done ahead of time so that someone doesn't get it in the first place. But when someone has cancer, let's talk about what's going on. Uh, exercise both during and after treatment will improve functional capacity. We've seen that in most of our conditions and disorders. Strength, functional mobility, so being able to move, you know, get in and out of your car, get off and onto the toilet. Your fatigue level, we've talked about how problematic that is. How depressing and anxiety uh, driving cancer can be and just health related quality of life exercise can help turn some of that stuff around or at least make it significantly better and benefits will vary however that depends on the type and the stage of the cancer and also the volume of the exercise program and there's a lot of recommendations there's a lot of tables in this chapter that really get into things that you can use for different types of cancer it is not a one-size-fits-all approach, as you would imagine, nor is it with any population, but each type of cancer is going to need a little bit more attention based on what some of the research out there says. And most of the research that's out there when it comes to exercise and all that 
has been focused on breast cancer and prostate cancer. So there really does need to be a growth in the literature and find out more about the effects of exercise on other types of cancer. Aerobic training, so let's start there. That can help with reducing nausea. That can help with improving just general functional capacity in terms of any aerobic performance that you might be going down, even if that's uh, as simple as going up or down a flight of stairs. Better movement in general, for functional movement, better body composition, so uh, maintaining healthy body weight and not being obese, reduced fatigue, better psychological well-being, and improved hematological and immune system variables. And that alone, especially when you're sick, just being able to help your immune system be more effective, uh, that's a good thing. Resistance training, so hitting the weights or doing some resistance, that can cause improvements in strength, mobility, flexibility, bone density. It can help with pain. There's one that's a little different because everything else is the same as a general population, right? It can also help with fatigue and that overall quality of life once again. When you combine the two, right, which you should always do, a comprehensive exercise program, there is what they found a lower incidence of recurring breast cancer related lymphedema, reduced severity of breast cancer related lymphedema and no delayed immunologic recovery and improved chemotherapy completion rates. So putting those things together, especially with someone who's, uh, who has been diagnosed and been treated for breast cancer, it seems to be a very, very beneficial protocol that should be used as part of their overall treatment plan. Now we've got some recommendations for kids and adults. Again, everything needs to be individualized. These tables are pretty long. They start out in on page 352. Goals are gonna be the same for healthy individuals. It's gen exercise is generally safe for people that have cancer, uh, but just there's a few limitations, contraindications, and it's, it's specific to each type that we, that it, someone might have. So just crack the book open if you're ever working with someone with it see what's there and go from there. There's some basic recommendations, very similar to some other things we've seen, starting with very low intensity, four or five times a week, major muscle group activity. Uh, again, as long as it doesn't interfere with any kind of surgi surgical therapies that they might have had or going through, again, nothing that uh, Nothing that's gonna hurt them. Just start with very low intensity stuff and move your way up from there in all different types of exercise, aerobic, resistance, and even flexibility. Now, you're not gonna just work with someone here. Again, with a lot of our conditions, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that they come to you with a doctor's medical clearance, especially someone uh, that has had anything that affects their lungs or their heart. You do not want to be on the line for anything there. You want some more instruction from their doctor. Those side effects that come as a result of the severity or of the medications that they're on, again, that's going to impact your programming choices. So always pay attention not only to their diagnosis, but also to the things that they are taking and the type of treatment they're receiving as a result. For lymphedema, we spent a little time talking about it. Here's the deal. If someone has lymphedema, vigorous upper body exercise should be performed very cautiously. Uh, reduce resistance or stop specific exercises according to symptom response. And then precautions such as wearing compression sleeves, lifting the arm above the head after exercise, and active light recovery may facilitate lymph return after exercise. So those are things that you might want to do. Encourage the use of compression sleeves. Get the arms above the head after exercise so that hopefully some of that fluid, that lymph fluid can drain and go back into the lymph nodes. And then an active light recovery. That's why a recovery session is so important. A nice good cool down, that might really help with it too. Okay, with a lot of stuff with cancer, as much as we know about it, there's still a lot we don't know. Little is really known about the effects of exercise on lower limb lymphedema. So caution really should be observed during, during training. If somebody's got lymphedema in their legs, be very, very careful. Let symptoms and pain and tolerance be your guide. Don't go crazy, folks. 
uh, and, and always be paying attention to new and outcoming research because it's changing all the time. Someone's going to be paying attention to these things. And as we have more information than you as a professional, it is your responsibility to arm yourself with that new information so you are better suited to help your clients. The last one here. Individual supervision is absolutely required here when someone is coming to you as a uh, as a cancer patient. Aerobic training, again, walking later consists of anything that's easily accessible for them. Resistance training should consist of at least one exercise for all major muscle groups. Volume and intensity, again, low, but bring up later. And then someone that is severely affected by their condition, medical treatments are both, or as someone who is really deconditioned, you just start lower and lower. That's really all there is to it. Again, as you're probably seeing, if you've been listening to these, a lot of the, while the conditions and the descriptions of them and the medications change, a lot of your recommendations for exercise, they remain the same. They start with lower intensity and you move your way up. Uh, when it comes to any of the specifics in terms of specific percentages or intensities or specific contraindications, well, that's where the benefit of listening to these and going to your book and pulling from these charts and tables is but if you've learned nothing else at this point i hope that you've really understood that anybody that comes to you with any one of these conditions that we're talking about you just need to make sure you do a little more homework on them know what's not going to hurt them but otherwise you're going to treat them like any other person you're going to work with you just have a few more uh, you might just have to get a little bit more creative that's all all right hope you enjoyed this watch the film answer the questions for the quiz and that's it for this chapter here on cancer chapter number 10 thanks everybody we'll see you on the next one